Hello and welcome back to Deep Sleep Creeps YouTube channel. Today we are going to be listening to an hour long video of true October horror stories. So get comfortable and let's begin. I was about 12 years old when this happened. It was going to be the last Halloween for me and my friends, so we wanted to make this a good one. It was myself, Mia and Riley. We all were 12 years old at the time and decided to dress up as our favourite fairy from Tinkerbell. Mia was Tinkerbell since she has the beautiful blonde hair. Riley was Vidya since she was the more blunt personality in the group. And I was Silver Mist mostly because I was a swimmer and that fairy controls water. It was going to be a full moon this Halloween night. And I was excited about it since I believed water has a connection with the moon. And I know creepy things happen when there's a full moon, especially on Halloween. My mum is a practicing Wiccan and she wanted me to wear a sigil necklace for protection since it was both Halloween and a full moon, but I didn't wear it because it didn't fit with my costume. My mum was mad but understood. I packed and got ready to leave since we decided to do trick or treating at Mia's house because Mia lived in a rich neighbourhood and they tend to pass out the largest candy which we liked. My mum dropped me off and I went into Mia's house and we all got ready together for Halloween. It was about 7pm and we were all getting ready to start our trick or treating with our cute fairy costumes. We also knew later that our cute fairy high heels would hurt to walk in, so Mia's brother promised to pick us up when we were done. We started going from house to house, laughing and enjoying the night. We talked about boys and crappy teachers and we went from house to house to get candy. We saw some kids with parents and some on their own just like us. It was cool seeing a mix of costumes and we laughed as some of the guys from our grade were wearing silly hot dogs and banana costumes. Then an hour into trick or treating myself and my friends noticed that a headless horseman costume had been following us. We all got an uneasy feeling. The costume had no head, but had a real horse. The strangest part I thought looking back on it now was why no one was crowded over the headless horseman because usually kids love horses. But at the time, we just thought that was a cool Halloween costume and continued on with our candy hunt. Each house we went to, we kept glancing over and seeing the headless horseman. He was there and still following us. He was keeping at a good distance, not too close and yet not too far. Riley told us to just keep ignoring him and eventually he'll go away. A lot of people like attention, so if we don't give him any of our attention, it'll be okay. So that is what we did. We ignored whoever that was and continued going from house to house until our feet hurt. After about three hours of trick or treating, we decided to call it a night. So Mia called up her brother and told him to come and get us and we gave him the address we were at. As we were waiting for Mia's brother, the headless horseman was still down the road hidden in the shadows under a tree. We all looked at each other and didn't know what to think of it. We were scared but were still surrounded by children, luckily and the house we were at were a friendly old couple and they gave us permission to wait on their front lawn for Mia's brother. Still, we all had an uneasy feeling, but we were surrounded by people so logically nothing should happen. Finally, after what seemed to be 15 minutes, probably five, Mia's brother came and passed by the headless horseman. We all hurriedly got in his car and we asked him if he'd seen the headless horseman. At first, Mia's brother laughed and said, no, I didn't see the headless horseman. Then we sat in silence as he was waiting for the punchline. Seriously, what's the joke? Mia's brother asked. Mia replied, No, look over there by the trees, don't you see him? Mia's brother looked and said, You mean the tree? Yes, there is a tree, but I wouldn't say it's a headless horseman. We were all confused. As we looked one final time, we didn't see him. Mia's brother said, Okay, you guys, you got me. You can stop messing with me. As he drove off, we all sat there in silence, very confused by what we saw. Mia's brother was also getting kind of nervous once he realized we weren't joking, but didn't say anything else the rest of the ride back. Once we got back, I wanted to spend the night at Mia's house, but my parents said no since it was still a school night. My mum picked me up and drove us back to our house. Once I got home, I started getting ready to go to bed, still thinking about the headless horseman. Just as I was about to go to bed, I looked out the window on my two-story bedroom window and I saw him just standing out in the road. Chills went down my spine as I realised what I just saw. My heart was beginning to beat faster in my chest. 
As I rubbed my eyes one last time, the headless horseman was gone. I just chalked it off to being tired and drowsy from all the candy I just binged on, so I went to bed, but sadly the nightmare didn't stop there. I later woke up in a panic and didn't know why. I woke up feeling like I was in danger. Then as I came to, I remembered the headless horseman again. As I got up and looked out the window, he was still there. Freaked out and about ready to get my parents, I turned around and there he was in my room with the horse on its two legs about ready to run. I screamed and screamed my lungs out until I woke up again. I ran and turned on the lights and realised it was a bad dream. As I looked around and gathered that no one was with me, I noticed that I was breathing heavily and I was sweating all over my body and was panicking like crazy. But as I tried to calm myself down, I realised that I can feel my throat hurting like I did in fact scream, but my family wasn't alarmed. I didn't wake anyone up. I was so confused and didn't understand what had happened. I looked at my window on the other side of my bedroom and started to panic again. Should I look outside, I thought. I know I needed to be sure I wasn't still dreaming or making it up. With the lights on, I hesitantly and slowly walked towards the window my heart still beating fast in my chest as I moved my curtain slowly and saw... nothing. It was a normal-looking empty street under the full moon. I breathed a sigh of relief and figured since it was 3am I wasn't going to go to sleep anytime soon, so I decided to take a melatonin pill and distracted myself with my phone for a bit to ignore what I just experienced and went back to sleep. The next day I told my nightmare to my friends early in the morning before classes started, and they all went silent. What? I asked. They all glanced at each other and said they had the same experience too. Only Mia's was a never-ending nightmare. She kept waking up over and over again until she just hid underneath her sheets and didn't look at the headless horseman in her bedroom. She kept repeating, You're not real, you're not real, until she went to sleep. Finally, she went back to sleep and got ready for school the next day. I didn't notice it before, but I could tell there were dark circles under her eyes and it was scary. After that, we never experienced the headless horseman again. We also promised to never talk about it because no one would believe us and it was so odd in general. Could it be linked to the full moon on Halloween? Or am I just going crazy trying to figure out what we all experienced as a group? Luckily, it was a one-time thing and we were done with Halloween after that. I sure hope he never comes back, but we'll see. I'm a 29-year-old woman, and I've been hiking on a wooded trail near my house for about three years. It's always been my favourite trail because of the beautiful waterfalls and meadows, but I've had some creepy encounters over the years. Fortunately, I always hike with my 90-pound Bernese dog, Max. He's a sweetheart, but will protect me. The first eerie encounter happened three years ago during the winter. I was walking up a hill when Max started growling like I'd never heard before. I looked around and noticed a man lurking in the shadows of the woods, watching us. When I greeted him as I usually do, he didn't respond. I decided to keep walking, but a feeling nagged at me to turn back. When I did, I saw that he had turned around on the trail, which was unusual for that location on a hill. Once he saw me, he stepped into the woods and stared out at the valley, hugging a tree. It was unsettling, to say the least. Around the same time a year later, I was hiking the same trail with Max. Again, he started growling, and this time, I noticed the same man standing in the shadows watching us. I assumed Max had simply spooked him, so he was keeping his distance, possibly waiting for us to cross the bridge. After crossing the bridge, I sensed that something was amiss. When I turned around, I realised that the man was now behind us, for no apparent reason, since he could have continued on the trail. I sat down with Max by my side, subtly checking my phone while making it clear that I'd spotted him. He stopped when I looked in his direction, although I was off the trail and not blocking his way, but resumed his walk after I took out my phone. As I walked back, I found a large stick he had left behind, which he had sharpened into a spear with a knife. I held on to the makeshift weapon and continued walking, keeping a vigilant eye on my surroundings. I now realise that I should have reported this incident, but at the time, I convinced myself I was being paranoid. 
About a year later, in winter, I returned to the same path. Probably unwise, but I had taken a year off from hiking and still thought I was just being paranoid. It was snowing and the trails were mostly empty. Suddenly I noticed several trees with frowning faces made out of snow, despite not having seen anyone on the trail for miles. Once again, Max started growling at something in the woods that I couldn't see, so we turned back. I didn't report this incident either because I didn't think it would be taken seriously. Then today, a few months later, I was walking the trail and came across a tree with ICU written in chalk. It immediately gave me a strange feeling, so I turned back and reported it to the park rangers and the police. Update one out of three. I'm working closely with the park rangers to stay vigilant. After sharing my story in hiking groups on Facebook, several women have come forward with similar experiences at the same location. One woman was stalked by a man wearing a full snowsuit in the middle of July on the same trail, and another was followed all the way to her car, with the man appearing along the trail, watching her from the woods at various points. Update 2. Six different women have come forward with similar experiences, all involving a man who looks strikingly similar at the same park. They've reported these incidents to the rangers. I was even interviewed by the local news, and it's now public knowledge. While the rangers may not be pleased with my decision to go public, everyone has a right to know about potential risks. Someone had wiped off the I see you message before the news team could see it possibly due to rain. Interestingly, three separate women messaged me, independently identifying the same guy, despite not knowing each other. They claimed he is unstable and spends most of his days at this park. His cousin reported him as well. I shared his name and photos with the rangers, and it turns out the suspect is an old park ranger himself, which is unsettling. Apparently the suspect has a penchant for climbing trees and has several photos of himself 50 feet in the air, which suggests he might be lurking from the treetops. Update 3. It has come to light that this man has a hidden spot in the woods where he keeps a chainsaw and gasoline. We reported this to the rangers. Having a secret campground in a public park is likely illegal, and stalking intimidation falls under illegal assault, so there's no reason he can't be at least questioned. When I was a high school senior, a group of my friends and I used to escape to the hills to drink and get away from our parents. On one particular night, I was the designated driver and drove four of my friends back. Two of the girls were pretty intoxicated and they began vomiting, so we decided to pull over in a park. Both girls opened the car doors to be sick outside when suddenly a pickup truck pulled up behind us with its high beams glaring. At that moment, I assumed it was the police, and I braced myself for the inevitable bust. However, the person in the pickup truck didn't move, just staying there. Eventually, we closed the car doors and continued driving. To our surprise, the pickup followed us. I stepped on the gas and navigated through a neighborhood I knew well, taking every turn and increasing our speed, but the pickup truck continued to pursue us. When my friends needed to vomit again, we pulled over once more and the pickup stopped behind us, keeping its lights trained on us. Glancing into my rearview mirror, I saw an older white man with a beard reaching into his glove compartment. Panic set in, and I urgently instructed my friends to pull my other friends back into the car before flooring the accelerator. We took a series of turns and managed to shake the pursuing truck. We found refuge in a random driveway for about 15 minutes before deciding it was safe to continue. We returned to the main street, only to find that the pickup truck was waiting for us. I drove as fast as I possibly could down the main street, and the pickup continued to tail us. Finally, at the bottom of a hill, we encountered a major accident scene with multiple police cars and fire trucks. I started to slow down as if I were going to pull over near the police. Surprisingly, the pickup truck overtook us, ran a red light right in front of the cops, and then vanished. To this day, I have no idea who that man was or what he wanted, but the whole experience was nothing short of terrifying. Around 12 years ago, 
I was still living with my family during my high school years. We moved into a condominium my parents purchased from a family friend. The condo had a unique history. It had once belonged to our family friend's mother, who had passed away from natural causes inside the condo. She was an older woman known for her friendly disposition and her occasional interest in witchcraft and black magic, although not for sinister purposes. It was more of a personal hobby for her as far as we knew. As we settled into our new home, we discovered that many of her belongings had been left behind. My parents decided to keep some of the furniture, including a few coffee tables. After a few months of living there, we began to sense that something peculiar was happening. Unlike the stereotypical haunted house experiences with flickering lights, strange noises or eerie shadows, our encounters were centred around a rather mundane item, twisty ties. You know, those small ties that come with loaves of bread? At random intervals, we'd find these twisty ties scattered around the house. They seemed to appear out of nowhere, placed in such a way that they'd be immediately noticeable. For example, I might be watching TV on the couch, get up to grab a drink in the kitchen, and return to find an unexpected twisty tie resting on the coffee table. We discovered them wrapped around cords, placed on countertops, tucked into desk drawers, and even once wrapped around my toothbrush. Each twisty tie was unique, varying in shape, colour and placement. It wasn't exactly a scary situation, but over time, we all became accustomed to looking for these surprise twisty ties. With three of us living in the condo, we naturally assumed someone was playing a prank and blamed each other. Yet none of us would confess to placing the twisty ties. Over the years, we each experienced isolated incidents that we couldn't explain, which led us to rule each other out. Surprisingly, it became more of an amusing mystery than a cause for alarm. We even fondly referred to the former owner as the twisty tie lady, and I started collecting the ties in my nightstand drawer just for fun. I often wondered why twisty ties of all things. I conducted extensive research online to see if they held any significance in witchcraft, but couldn't find any relevant information. It was only a few years later, after moving out, that I learned the twisty ties had been a kind of inside joke between the lady and her daughter, our family friend, while she was alive. They had a pact to save all the twisty ties for some unknown purpose. I suppose it was her unique way of communicating from beyond the grave. I reside in a small cul-de-sac located in a remote, isolated area. The nearest neighbourhood is a substantial four-mile drive away. One night, a few years ago, we were hit by an unexpected snowstorm that dumped over a foot and a half of snow on us. Given our distance from the main roads and it being the weekend, I knew it would take a while for the snow ploughs to reach our area. Curiosity got the best of me, and I stepped out onto my back deck to admire the snow-covered trees and the relentless, cascading flurries. I decided to take a few pictures when I noticed peculiar footprints leading to my door, only to turn around and disappear into the snowy landscape. The footprints originated from my neighbour's side, and my initial assumption was that one of their rambunctious children had played a prank, as my sledding tube on the railing was found deflated. I thought I'd wait until later in the day to contact their parents. As I was scrolling through Facebook for a while, I came across a post from another neighbour closer to the entrance of our cul-de-sac, which read, Did someone knock on my back door or something? My immediate reaction was to call her and share my concerns. I called the neighbour residing at the entrance and informed him about the situation. He decided to investigate and found a similar scenario at his place. This unusual discovery prompted a chain reaction, with everyone in our small community calling each other. I reached out to the family at the far end, and they assured me there were no footprints leading to their property. However, my next door neighbour called me with a perplexing update. She had spoken with the woman living next to the last house at the end, who revealed that there were footprints leading to her door but none leading away from it. By this point we had already contacted the police, but we decided to reach out to them once more, categorising the situation as an emergency. However, they explained that the roads remained unploughed, and their ability to dispatch a plough truck was limited, 
as they were a privately owned company. The woman who had the footprints leading to her door was on the verge of panic. A kind-hearted neighbour, a burly man from across the road, sent her a text message, pretending to invite her over to his house. When he arrived, she left her house to join him. In response to the eerie circumstances, one of our neighbours set up a live feed motion-activated hunting camera facing all the exits of the property. However, no one appeared on the footage. Eventually, around 7pm, a snowplow truck and three police cars arrived on the scene. The woman who had temporarily sought refuge in another neighbour's home, along with her hosts, returned to her house and stood at the doorway while the police conducted a thorough search. Despite their efforts, they found nothing. The woman pleaded with the police to continue their search and they obliged. Two officers decided to check the basement once more. This time, only one of them emerged. He took the woman into a side room and we could hear her hysterical crying from outside. A few of us, mainly the men, were about to approach the door when we were intercepted by several police officers. The police had found someone hidden under a makeshift cover in a hidden opening within the stairwell, an area the woman wasn't even aware of. A few minutes later, a dishevelled man was brought out in handcuffs, screaming and resisting. He was subsequently led away by the police. In the makeshift hideout, they discovered blankets, which she had recently cleaned and stored away. It was located in the room adjacent to hers. She chose to stay in other people's houses for an extended period before eventually returning. Even then, she was hesitant to stay alone and decided to sell her house the following summer. As it turned out, the intruder was a thrill-seeking drug addict who was on probation for assaulting a family member. According to the police, it appeared that he didn't want to remain at his apartment after a heated argument with his roommate. He had taken his roommate's car from a neighbouring county and got stuck in our unploughed roads. This incident served as a stark reminder of the importance of always ensuring that your doors are securely locked. Many years ago, I worked as a kitchen manager, a position that required me to carry a handgun on occasion. This was primarily because I had to make late night runs to deposit large amounts of cash, and I had also faced some issues with former employees who had been semi-stalking me. One evening after finishing my shift, I made my way back to my apartment on a dead-end street. The rain had just stopped, leaving everything wet. As I ascended the steps to my door, I fumbled for my keys. It was then that I noticed something unsettling. Four footprints led to my door and they clearly didn't belong to me. What's more, these footprints didn't turn around as one might expect. My heart raced as I tried the doorknob, only to find it unlocked. This was a grave oversight, as I never left my door unlocked. Terrified, I drew my pistol, ready for whatever awaited me inside. I pushed the door open slowly, prepared for anything, but there was nothing to be found. I meticulously searched every room, checked inside closets, and inspected every nook and cranny. There was no sign of an intruder, and everything in my apartment was as I had left it. Nothing had been moved or stolen. I remained convinced that someone had somehow entered my apartment, briefly surveyed the surroundings, and then departed, leaving my door unlocked. But the question that haunted me was, why break in if they had no intention of taking any of the valuable items I had? The next day, I approached my landlord with whom I had a good relationship, to inquire if he or a maintenance worker had entered my apartment. His response was an emphatic denial. No one had entered on a Saturday night without prior notice. I never managed to figure out who had paid me an unexpected visit that night, and I spent weeks afterwards sleeping with extreme caution. Looking back, I couldn't help but think that I would have felt much better if a petty thief had stolen my belongings, like my TV and other valuables. At least that would have made sense. Instead, all the intruder took was my sense of security, leaving me to wonder if that was the very purpose of their visit. I have a memory from when I was 14 years old, and I'm currently 17, but this particular incident still lingers in my mind. It happened one night when I found myself home alone. 
My mum was working an overnight shift and my older brother was not living at home during that period, so I had the entire house to myself. It was around 9 or 9.30 p.m. and I was in my room, diligently working on my homework while listening to music through my headphones. The volume was cranked up, making it nearly impossible for me to hear anything else. I distinctly remember that all the doors were locked, and since I had been home alone frequently, I felt no reason to be concerned. About an hour later I decided to take a break from my schoolwork, so I removed my headphones. It was at this point that I heard unusual noises emanating from my kitchen, accompanied by the sound of footsteps moving about downstairs. This was puzzling, as my mum was not due back until 7am the following morning. Nevertheless, I considered the possibility that she had returned early for some reason. To be certain, I locked my bedroom door and sent her a text message asking if she had come home. It took her approximately 10 minutes to respond, but when she did, she informed me that she was still at work and inquired why I was asking. This was the moment I started to panic because my mum and brother were the only ones with keys to the house apart from me. So I decided to text my brother, and he too confirmed that he was not at home. I promptly informed both my brother and mum about the situation, and my brother, who happened to be nearby, assured me that he would be home soon and advised me to call the police. While attempting to find a hiding spot in my room with my phone to make the call, I distinctly heard my name being called from downstairs. This raised questions in my mind. Did the intruder know me personally? Perhaps a family friend? I refrained from responding, fueled by the fear of someone who not only knew my name but was also calling it, and I couldn't identify the voice. I dialed the police and was in conversation with them when I heard my name being called once again, followed by the chilling statement, I know you're up there. I also heard someone starting to ascend the stairs. Once more I refrained from responding, but I was paralysed with fear. The police assured me they were on their way and advised me to remain where I was. Throughout this ordeal, I continued texting my brother, who informed me that he was just five minutes away. It was then that I heard the front door slam shut. Approximately five minutes after the door slammed, the police arrived at my residence. They confirmed their presence, and I was told I could come out of my hiding place. Shortly thereafter, my brother returned home. The police conducted a thorough search of the property and the house, but they found no trace of the intruder. However, there was visible damage on the door and lock, indicating that it had been forcibly opened with some sort of tool used to pick the lock. Curiously, nothing appeared to have been stolen. But what was unsettling was the fact that the intruder remained elusive. In the aftermath of that night, we had security cameras installed, along with a more secure lock on our doors. In North Carolina, there are the Brown Mountain Lights. You can look them up online. My journey to discover these lights began when I noticed strange illuminations in our woods. Our home is nestled on 10 acres, perched on the side of a mountain, with the house situated at the summit. Below us there are three residences and one vacant lot, each encompassing 10 to 20 acres of woodland. The owners of these properties are sporadic weekend or occasional residents. The sole access to these lots is a private road that crosses our land near our house. I often spend time outside, and I'm usually observant of our neighbours' comings and goings. Traffic is so infrequent that I might encounter just one vehicle passing by during the entire week. I've spotted lights in our woods that defy easy explanation. Our location is relatively remote, so if it were an all-terrain vehicle, ATV, I'd certainly hear the engine. These neighbouring lots cannot be accessed via ATV from outside our neighbourhood due to a river at the bottom of the mountain and an old logging road that's obstructed by a massive fallen tree with a ditch dug out to further deter any attempts to traverse that overgrown path. I've travelled the nearest road that's somewhat proximate and the lights I observe don't originate from that road. Between our house and that road lies a 15-foot earthen barrier followed by a steeply wooded mountainside that ascends from there. There's no direct line of sight to my house from that road, which is approximately a mile away, descending through thickly wooded terrain. 
I've attempted to discern some of the lights as perhaps our neighbours walking their driveways to visit each other, as they often congregate during weekends when folks are around. Yet there are instances with no discernible explanation. The surroundings are incredibly quiet, with the sound of falling leaves audible in the autumn, or the crunch of gravel under the tyres of passing trucks, accompanied by the noise of the engine if a vehicle is navigating our road or the road near the river. To underscore the silence, I can even hear the footsteps of squirrels, turkeys, deer and other wildlife as they traverse the forest floor, especially during the fall and winter when the leaves are scattered around. In terms of details, the lights I've observed typically consist of a single source, as opposed to the dual headlights of a vehicle, not forming a cluster of lights associated with a group of people. They move horizontally, unlike the upward floating motion of the brown mountain lights, they shine quite brightly, akin to a large flashlight or a single headlight, and don't resemble the descriptions of lights associated with gas pockets. Moreover, I haven't heard dogs barking or any noises that might be indicative of trespassing hunters. I've relinquished my attempts to discern their origins. I suspect they may be emanating from human flashlights or distant cars, although the latter seems improbable. Our neighbours' homes are the closest ones in sight, typically situated more than three miles away in a straight line and often obscured by multiple mountain ridges. So I don't know. Does anyone know what it is or what I'm talking about? I'm sure there's a perfectly reasonable explanation for everything and I just don't have one good logical explanation for this particular incident. My parents made a spontaneous decision to move to this town the cost of living in the city had become unbearable, so they opted for a small town called Sutton. In Sutton, we could afford a whole house with three bedrooms. I had my own room and they had theirs. We even had a spare room for guests, although we doubted we'd have any visitors. At the beginning, the town seemed charming enough. It had a small centre with shops and a marketplace, and the people were enthusiastic about community activities. They organised fruit and vegetable contests, celebrated each season and held regular town meetings. It was as if they were trying to distract themselves from some underlying issue in Sutton. I wasn't thrilled about the move initially, but I could see how happy it made my parents. Besides, I only had one year of high school left and had plans to move away for college. Little did I know I'd never get that chance. We moved to Sutton on the 1st of October a year ago and our neighbours welcomed us with open arms. The first ones to greet us were the Millers who lived next door. Mr and Mrs Miller arrived with a large wooden basket filled with baked goods and smiles that never left their faces. As we unpacked our belongings in the living room, the Millers knocked on our door. My mum welcomed them while my dad and I listened to the conversation. Oh, what a fantastic decision you made buying this house, Mrs Miller said, and at the perfect time too. We noticed you have a daughter. She appears to be around the same age as our Ethan. Maybe he can show her the fun a young person can have in Sutton. Mr Miller spoke rapidly. Mum couldn't get a word in edgewise. Yes, that would be wonderful. The three of you should come to dinner sometime. We'd love to introduce you to our town, Mrs Miller continued. Have you met Harry yet? Dad got up and walked towards the door slowly. Oh, you must be the husband, hello. Both my parents were city people and I could tell they were overwhelmed by the warmth of the townspeople, but they couldn't help but smile. After the Millers left, we indulged in the treats they had brought, but we were interrupted every few minutes by new neighbours bearing more gifts. After the last ones, Dad closed the door and sighed. The three of us looked at each other for a moment, then started laughing. This is going to take some getting used to, Mum chuckled but it could be worse, right? Well, at least we don't have to worry about cooking lunch or dinner today, I added, considering the assortment of casseroles, pies and salads we'd received. They are a little peculiar, but nice, I suppose, Dad said. I'm sure we'll get used to it. A bunch of parents are already planning friendships between you and their kids, Avery. You're already so popular, he joked. Yeah, maybe I can become Harry's friend. Oh yes, what was that about? Mum asked. They all talked about this Harry person, but nobody ever told us who he actually is. Maybe the mayor? 
due to the fall holidays, I would wait to start school, and I wasn't planning on forming friendships in this town. I had friends back in the city, and like I said, I was planning to move away for college soon. So I spent those days with my parents. The next day, Mum and I decided to visit the grocery store recommended by our neighbours to stock up on essentials. We walked to the town centre, which took us about ten minutes to reach. I expected a conventional grocery store, but it was more like a tiny kiosk with only the bare essentials. They carried local produce and unbranded items with a heavy emphasis on vegetables and dairy products. The lady behind the counter gave us a broad smile. You made an excellent choice of items. Everything we sell is produced locally. Oh, that's nice, my mother responded. Yes, it's lovely, isn't it? What about things like toilet paper, I inquired. Well, no, not everything but nearly everything. We try not to depend on the outside world. Harry wouldn't like that, she whispered as she said the name Harry. Mum and I exchanged a puzzled look. Yes, well, who exactly is this Harry? We keep hearing that name and... Mum stopped speaking when she saw the woman's face turn pale. You'll find out soon enough, but hopefully not too soon. Just remember, we all stick together here. This response only confused us further but the woman wouldn't answer any more questions. Instead, she attempted to distract us with details about the upcoming fall festival. I wish she had been mistaken and that we would have more time to escape. But that night I saw Harry. My parents had already gone to bed and the street outside was eerily quiet. I was in my room watching a show when I heard strange dragging footsteps. They sounded more like someone dragging themselves across the floor. I went to my window but couldn't see much at first. The street was dark. All the lights in the houses were off and the townspeople had lowered their shades earlier in the evening. As my eyes adjusted, I saw where the noise was coming from. I noticed a man in torn clothes with straw-like material sticking out from his limbs. His movements were awkward and slow, his body bent and crooked, as if he were injured. Every now and then he changed direction slightly, walking in a zigzag pattern. My room was the only one with a light on and it drew his attention. My heart raced, but I couldn't move. The rest of my body was frozen. Then my door opened and my light was turned off. I tried to scream, but no sound came out. A hand pulled me out of my room and into the hallway. It was Dad. Did you see that? He whispered. I saw Mum standing in front of their bedroom door. I nodded, finally able to speak as my voice returned. I didn't want to admit that my parents were as frightened as I was. What a weirdo, my mother remarked. Joanna, I'm just saying it's the middle of the night. He looks like he's on drugs. Why did you pull me out here? I asked. I didn't want to accept that my parents might be as scared as I was. We saw him looking up, and when we came to the hallway, your light was on. He was looking at you, my mum whispered. Dad walked back to my room and said after a while, He's gone. When morning came, we were all feeling better. In the daylight, our fear from the previous night seemed absurd. It was probably just some drunk guy coming home from an early Halloween party, Dad said during breakfast. Yeah, I agreed. I still didn't like the way he stared at me, though. Mum absent-mindedly rearranged the scrambled eggs on her plate, not really eating anything. Have you met this Harry yet? She asked after a while. I'd been thinking the same thing. We were able to laugh about it, but it didn't change the fact that something about this place didn't feel right. That evening, we received an invitation to dinner at the Miller's house. Initially, I didn't want to go with my parents, but I thought it might be a good opportunity to find out more about Harry and Sutton, so I joined them. Mum bought a bottle of her favourite wine which she'd stocked up on in the city before we moved. The Millers were ecstatic about it, and we all sat down at their dinner table, already filled with appetizers and decorations. The townspeople were excellent hosts. Mr Miller opened the wine and poured it for everyone, including me. This is fantastic. I can't remember the last time I had wine this good, Mrs Miller exclaimed. I'm glad you like it, my mother said. I still have a few bottles. I can get more once we run out. The Millers exchanged a strange glance, but didn't say more. Ethan, Mr Miller suddenly called out. Dinner is starting. 
He looked at us apologetically. Our son is sometimes lost in his own world. We'd already started eating when Ethan finally came to the dining room. He resembled his dad with black hair and a tall stature. His mother was the opposite, very short with red curls. He was dressed casually in a t-shirt and ripped jeans, while his parents looked like they were dressed for a 1950s dinner party. Ethan, meet our new neighbours, Eli and Joanna Russell and their daughter, Avery. Hi, he mumbled as he sat in the empty chair opposite me. Ethan was the first person we met in Sutton who didn't smile when he saw us. He was quiet throughout dinner while his parents continued to speak without pause. Toward the end of the meal, my mum decided to interrupt the strange couple by telling them about what we'd seen the previous night. There was a moment of silence. The Millers looked very uncomfortable but kept their smiles. That was Harry, Ethan finally said. That's what I thought, but we really don't understand this. Does this happen more often? Does Harry have some kind of psychological problem? My mother bluntly asked. Mrs Miller shushed her. Sorry, Joanna, that was rude of me. But we don't talk badly about Harry. Oh, I wasn't trying to. The man was staring at our daughter at night, and we were just concerned, that's all. We don't want you to feel uncomfortable. Everyone here is so happy that you moved to Sutton, Mr Miller added. It's just not easy to explain who Harry is. Has he ever harmed anyone here? Dad asked. Again, silence. The dinner ended awkwardly, and we left with more questions than answers. The next day, my mum suggested that we take a day trip to explore nearby towns and find a place with a decent grocery store. We all felt creeped out and wanted to get away for a while, although we didn't admit it. We packed a few essentials and got in the car, planning to drive away and explore. However, as we attempted to leave Sutton, we realised that we couldn't escape. The GPS malfunctioned, streets led to dead ends, and our attempts to drive back the way we came were fruitless. The town seemed like a maze and we were trapped. A few weeks passed and we had no way out of Sutton. Our attempts to escape had all been in vain. We felt like we were losing our minds. Slowly we resigned ourselves to our new life. My parents began to assimilate, dressing and acting like the townspeople, participating in town events and making friends who were just as lost as they were. If anyone else has experienced something like this before and knows how to get out, please let us know. Let us. My partner and I went camping in West Virginia for the first time last night. We were driving back home from Richmond, Virginia and decided to stop and do some light hikes and camp out overnight on the way back. We were able to snag a camp spot at the Kanawha River campsite. By the time we got there, the sun had just set. We were the first campsite on the grounds with no one else visibly nearby. Despite this, we got the tent up pretty quickly and wanted to start a fire but it had rained earlier in the day and the fire pit was soaked. We tried for about an hour, and although we got some good embers and a few flames, nothing quite held up. We might have tried longer, but we kept hearing howling that sounded like a dead ringer for a wolf. Singular, only one howl at a time, periodically, and seemed to be getting louder each time. I should mention now that due to lack of internet and therefore lack of music or podcasts, I spent the time setting up and attempting a fire whistling off and on out of habit. We were exhausted by the day, and maybe feeling a little paranoia as a result. So forgoing the fire was an easy L to take. We hung our little electric lantern with dimmer lighting from the ceiling of our tent, zipped up the walls and tucked ourselves in just after 9.30. We were passed out by 11. It wasn't until later that we heard something neither of us can really explain. I woke up suddenly to a piercing sound. The only way I can describe it is as a howling wind filled with thousands of shrieks and screams happening all at once. But from inside the tent there appeared to be no movement at all outside, the tent sitting completely still. No wind. I grabbed my partner's shoulder and he was already awake and we listened for a few more minutes, unmoving and silently. It lasted about three to five minutes altogether. After it stopped, I checked my phone. It was 2.30 a.m. After both confirming to the other that that had happened and they weren't crazy, we tried not to think about it too much and go back to sleep. Nothing else happened. 
and in the morning we asked some other campers further into the campsite if they had heard anything last night, and one woman said she had. I'm sharing this because that sound is going to haunt me forever if I can't figure out what it came from. From what we've looked up, there aren't even wolves in that area, and there are no nearby trains or any type of infrastructure that could have made the noise. It could be an owl of some sort, but even then it sounded like a chorus of them for an extended period of time. I've also seen that whistling is a terrible thing to do in the Appalachian woods, but I don't know if that's real folklore or just TikTok propaganda. Would love if anyone knows what it could have been or has any insights, paranormal or not.